Good afternoon. Yeah. So for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Counsel, and I have my new uh, co-worker, Anthea Dexter Cooper, who is working with Peter and uh, Becky, the new kind of money team for Legislative oh, Counsel. Nice. So she has been working on the taxes uh, and uh, well, somewhat on the fees on this, and so she's that she's the she's the new person, but she's the expert on this on the on the cannabis tax. Peter so, has informed me that we are in very good. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I feel better having her here right next to me. <laughs> so, um, so you should have I think a copy of the bills introduced for S fifty four. You'll also you'll also have I think two other documents that they put in there for you. Uh, one is kind of a, a brief section by section summary. Uh, of the bill, and then there's also a timeline. So I'm just going to talk very big picture to give you the context, so you can go in and, and start to talk about um, the fees and the taxes in here, for so you can have some context. <coughs> so I know there's several of you on this committee who have been here through some of the other tax and regulate proposals that's been around, kicking around the Senate for I think at least four years that y'all have passed something annually on this. Um, so a lot of it will sound familiar. One of the major differences in, uh, with regard to prior bills is that instead of, I think before, the idea was to put it in one of the existing agencies uh, and have them regulate it. So first proposals were in Department of Public Safety and then that transferred to Agency of Agriculture. One of the big differences with S54 is it envisions a new independent executive uh, agency, which would be the Board of Cannabis Control, and uh, and that would be there would be appointments from the Senate, from the House, from the Governor, and from the Attorney General's office. And you'll see on the timeline here, we just go in, we just combine liquor and lottery. It does in. not. It no, does and not. I think you'll hear this Jake here. Yep. So he'll talk to you about the commission's recommendation, and that was something that they had talked about the idea of a board or commission that might be housed in the Girl Lottery. This is independent, so it's not within an existing department or agency. It'll be its own thing. Um, and so they would get uh, get appointed during the summer and get rolling in the fall hire an executive director and administrative assistant. And so they, that's the staff, that would be the initial staff. And the idea for the sponsor, with the sponsors for this and starting out here is that you start out with the board and they start really all the regulatory uh, groundwork for getting the program off the ground. So uh, rulemaking, so rulemaking is gonna take at least 10 to 12 months. So that first year, it's really gonna just be the board and their two staff people. Um, Something that was is different now in this proposal than earlier when you had to think about the RAND report mm -hmm. that came out. And there was a lot of data in the RAND report that the Senate used in crafting 241 and trying to determine what your fees were going to be for different types of licenses. So in this proposal, there's five different types of licenses for cannabis establishments. There's cultivators, wholesalers, uh, product manufacturers, retailers, and testing laboratories. And so there's um, and in the earlier proposals for like 241 is we had some data from the RAND report in order to do, for JFO and others to do some estimations on canopy size and how many people are regular users of cannabis, what might the market, you know, you know be looking for. Um, but a lot's obviously changed since then. So when the RAND report came out, we didn't have any legal states around us and we didn't, we hadn't yet legalized marijuana here in Vermont. And so we think now that we have Massachusetts on our southern border, Maine is coming online soon. Uh, and then in every other new uh, northeastern state, the governor has come, well, except for New Hampshire, has come out in support of, uh, of a tax and regulate system in that state. So it looks as though the northeast, you know, along is kind of going the way of the west coast. Um, and so what does that mean for the market in terms of how much are you going to sell? What are people looking to buy if they can get it from the neighbors or literally from their neighbors because your neighbor can grow to mature plants uh, and you can trade and you can share up to an ounce of, of cannabis between people 21 years of age or older. But you can also go to stores in Massachusetts now and you can bring it back to Vermont. Um, so, uh, so 
what the proposal does is has the, instead of setting the fees in here, is it has the executive director after kind of coming together with the board, trying to do some work and some estimation, pulling together the data, is that the ED will come before <coughs> the legislature next January with a proposal for fees. And so I don't know if you want me to like show you specific language in here or just still talk kind of conceptually. What's your preference? I think kind of conceptually okay. at this point is this is just our first go sure. through and um, I think just to get a conceptual idea of what we're dealing with and then we can I'm sure, Mike says, so this committee wouldn't be uh, looking to set fees then on its own until next, next year. year, okay? Right. And so at this point, right. and they wouldn't be doing it. They would be coming to you and saying, "This is what we think." Right, and then you know, you we're, we think we're going to either you. issue unlimited licenses in these particular categories, okay. or we're going to issue 20 of these types. We're going to have them tiered in this particular way with regard to cultivators. We think that we're going to price them in this way. There's going to be different types of fees, everything from application fees, which will be the, obviously the first fees coming in, but those still won't come in if you look at the timeline because you have to wait and have them adopt the rules. Um, and then the fees that you guys would adopt next year upon recommendation of the board would go into effect in July 1st, 2020. And so your first fees wouldn't be coming in until fiscal year 2021. Was the GD's established be linked in any way to the estimated costs that might be incurred by the state? Yes, exactly. So there is do they have a process then of doing that? There what? is language in there, and I think um, I think there's some stock language tying it to some language in Title 32 around it's to uh, that the fees are to be uh, they're put into a special fund and they're to be used for the implementation and regulation of the program. Um, but I, I know what you're talking about in terms of trying yeah, to track, basically track to try calculating what the costs are exactly. going to be, both in terms of software, manpower, uh, and then yes. in terms of determining the cost, is there any mechanism to say what categories uh, would be looked at? For example, enforcement, education, health, prevention, whatever the case may be, if those are... I don't think it's it's um, that detailed in this proposal about how they would do that, but I think that that was what was envisioned by the sponsors, which is why they decided at this point in this proposal, they didn't have the information that they would need in order to get the right fees set at this time in this draft, which is why they're saying, you know, if you have this board come together, mm -hmm. collect the information, they're the experts, then they would be better suited to come back to you in January and give you a, a more accurate estimation of, of what those fees should be to support the program. Um, so, uh, where was I? So, different types of fees, everything from application fees to annual fees. Um, and not only for the new cannabis establishments, but uh, the draft proposes that eventually the medical registry, which is currently under the Department of Public Safety, as well as the dispensary program, um, that those shift over from the Department of Public Safety to the Board of Cannabis July 1st, I mean, uh, January 1st in 2021. So once the board is up and fully running and they're in the process of accepting applications and starting to issue, issue uh, permits for the new cannabis establishments, then they would shift the existing programs so over. So you have all of, regula all of the cannabis regulations <coughs> under, under one Not agency. Not all sales of the medical marijuana system that's been, because that's what I heard through the grapevine, that we were just doing away with it and the cannabis board would be just regulated. They would be regulated, but probably with as much expertise as the Department of Public Safety has. But we aren't dismantling the whole pharmaceuticals. No. no. And oh, there good. is language in here specifically that talks about the General Assembly's um, intent to maintain the medical registry and a dispensary program because they because the general assembly finds value in having that in addition to a regulated retail market um, but we, you have to imagine is that if you we have a lot of rules around the medical registry in terms of who can get on and qualifying mm -hmm. conditions and what you have to do and how dispensaries are run um, and a lot of things 
that are done currently in that system don't necessarily make sense alongside a retail system. So if, if anyone can go to a, a retail cannabis establishment and purchase an ounce uh, of cannabis, then um, does it still make sense to make a patient um, jump through a bunch of hoops in order to do that and, you know, and make an appointment and do the other things that they have to do under the current system? So, um, so there is language in the bill that adopts a new structure, statutory structure for the medical registry and for dispensaries and has the board adopt rules. So, it could, so at the same time as they're adopting rules for the cannabis establishments, they're also doing it for the new medical registry and the dispensary. But the programs should be, the goal is to be seamless and shifting the number. Would you be selling all the same stuff in a cannabis store as opposed to a cannabis registry? Um, there will probably be a lot of similarities. Um, there's language in here that directs the board to be thinking about where it makes sense to have things the same and where maybe there should be some differences. There's also some statutory language in here that talks about things that dispensaries could do that a retail cannabis establishment couldn't do or a, or a cannabis establishment. So under the proposal, uh, cannabis establishments, you could have one of each of the five licenses, but no more than that. Um, but it doesn't, you, so you could be vertically integrated, but you'd have to get one of each of the five licenses. Right now, our, and, and the proposal would stay the same in 54, is you could continue to be vertically integrated under for a dispensary license. Um, also in here is dispensaries would be able to continue to deliver, but uh, retail cannabis establishments would not. Um, the board can allow dispensaries to offer different types of products to medical patients and their caregivers that might not be available on the retail market, so it might have a higher THC content or it might be a type of product that normally or that the board wouldn't consider for the retail market. So, um, so the, the sponsors wanted to build in some advantages for dispensaries in order to uh, provide an incentive for there to continue being uh, dispensaries that serve the medical market. Yeah, because you would sell for medication otherwise. If you just go to your retail store and say, well, I'll see if that works. Right. You're into self-medication. Well, and it, this does allow a, someone who is a dispensary owner to apply for the, the, the retail uh, or one of the other permits in the cannabis mm -hmm. establishment as well, so they could hold one of each. Yeah. yeah but if you have a liquor license, it has to be in a separate part of your grocery store. Right, and the, there is language in here that talks about that the board is to establish by rule uh, some criteria for ensuring patient confidentiality or to think about maybe the special circumstances mm -hmm. of maybe you have an elderly patient who's going for the first time and wants to have some counseling services around which products and things like that and doesn't necessarily want to be in, in the, the other I, half. I just remember the stories about the ladies from Wake Robin that didn't want to go into the liquor store to get their sherry, and so would we let the general store dis sell sherry. I don't believe we've done that yet, but uh, you just mm. didn't want to be seen, and I can see where there were people who would not want to be seen going into a cannabis store. Right now, we don't. For medical needs or whatever. Yeah, yeah. for medical needs. We, right now, we don't broadcast the locations. So I, I'm going into some blank storefront somewhere in Montpelier. I don't even, I know there's one here. I just don't know where. Um, yeah, right. So if I see someone going in there, I don't know what they're going in there for. But if it's a big cannabis emporium sign, then everybody, then people might not go. And the bill takes note of it, but doesn't say how that has to play out. And again, because states do it differently, um, some have uh, the can do the same operation, but you have one side of the store is medical and the other is retail, and it just leaves it up to the board to I think be looking at other jurisdictions and figuring out what would work. Yeah, because my understanding is that we have probably the best regulated and best medical marijuana system in the country we haven't had you know it was just a way to kind of legalize it wink wink as I've heard in other states and I'd hate in doing this I'd hate to to 
lose what we've done very well in the medical marijuana area. Yeah, a lot of the states that went first, you know, I think we were ninth when, I think in 2004 was when we started the registry, and then in 2011 was when you passed the dispensary law. Um, but a lot of this, the earlier states were done by ballot initiative, so it was more kind of, so voters passed something and then regulators were in the process of just trying to catch up. Figure out what yeah. you do with and it. so, you know, in yeah. some places like Colorado and Washington, those, the medical programs that, that were early on were fairly unregulated. Yeah, um, and I, 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 hate, I just hate to see us lose something that, that we've done well um, in the process of move, at least moving too quickly to undo it. Okay. So, um, so I don't know. I think maybe we get to the taxes. If you look at the if you look at the timeline, um, you'll see that the the they wouldn't start. The board would not start issuing licenses for retailers until April first, twenty twenty one. So that that would be the the earliest date under this proposal in which you'd see any any retail sales. Un, um, right now, cannabis and cannabis products that are sold by dispensaries are, are not taxed, and that would continue to be the case in here. Okay. I didn't quite get that. Could you repeat that? So uh, currently, for the disp when the dispensaries sell cannabis mm -hmm. to patients, it's not taxed. Mm -hmm. And um, that would continue to be the case under this proposal. So if it's going, it's being sold by by a licensed dispensary, it would be taxed. Now, is there any requirement in the bill, as far as the setting of the tax rates, that the tax rates have to produce the anticipated revenue sufficient for all of the expenses? Um, well, the the taxes go to the general fund. Mm -hmm. So, so there's no so, connection then between the expenses that the state will share and the amount of tax revenue that this is targeted to produce? Right. So this is, again, different from earlier proposals that the Senate has passed where the fees are supporting the regulatory structure and running the program and the taxes would go to the general fund. And is there, though, there is a requirement that the, uh, the, the board provide the legislature with information as to the amount of money that would be raised based on their recommendation and also on the amount of expense that the state would incur as a result of cannabis? Is there a requirement? I don't that? know necessarily. Uh, I mean, I think, I think it anticipates that in terms of the coming the uh, board coming before you and requesting, putting part of their proposal forward with regard to fees, um, and they're going to come and they have to bring you their budget, and they're going to come and say, well, it looks like for FY 2021, we're going to need a, a plant health specialist, we're going to need this and that, so I would imagine that all happened, but it, there's not, I don't think that there's actually specific language um, like you're talking just to point out, part of the dynamic is the fees start to come in soon, well before obviously any uh, revenue from sale of marijuana. Mm -hmm. No, a year and a half, and so yeah. No, I understand so that very clearly in the beginning. If you have to stand up. Yeah. Well, what I was really looking for is that that my understanding is that the board will set the fees to be charged at retail, right? Well, no, you no, will. No. The board well, is but they're going to make recommendations yeah. to right. us to do that. But not at retail. No. Is that right? It's no. No, it's no. 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 The fees would be for an application for different types mm -hmm. of per, for licenses. It would be for the annual license fee. It would be for all of those types of, of, of things, but mm -hmm. not for it would. But the but the board would be. Um, uh, looking at regulating everything that's done with mm -hmm. regard to that retail facility. But I don't know that they would be doing any kind of price controls or anything like that. Is that what you mean? Well, I, I guess what I was really looking at is at, at, you know, once a regimen is established, is anyone looking at whether or not the cost the state is going to incur is going to exceed the amount of revenues coming from taxation? I would imagine Y'all, that's what y'all do all the time, but I don't think that there's language in here specifically yeah. 
directing them to, to do that. So you're talking about mean across state government, yeah, what would the cost yeah. be? Yeah. Basically, how much money are we going to spend and what are we going to get? And gee, and from setting tax policy, that's pretty important. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to get into. <clears throat> this one, the last bill that came through, I believe the tax money was dedicated to public safety and some prevention education. This one, yeah, it all, all of the fees and all of the tax money went into one fund and right. then supported running the program as well as prevention, as well as law enforcement, and I think a variety like of, of issues. Is, right. But this one nope. is, so the tax money comes into the general fund, and we do what we do with it, and I think we'll be doing a cost benefit. We are, I'm sure Jane Kitchell will. Um, to see, you know, if that tax is the correct number. Um, I believe we've been told that it is lower than it has been because we're trying to chill, go from a black market to a public market and we're trying to disincentivize black market, but I'm still, I need someone to come tell me what things cost on the black market before I know if we're pricing it correctly. I haven't had anyone come forward, but if anyone can help. And Senator Brock, I'm wondering what sorts of costs, if you could just give us an example of what sorts of well, uh, is there an increased cost enforcement that the state might incur? Are there increased uh, uh, spending that needs to be done on education, particularly youth education? Are there increased costs that we might experience based on what other states have done in terms of how health costs, emergency treatment, automobile, all of those yeah. things, those are costs. And what I just want to make sure of is sure, creating uh, yeah. a, a, a spending sinkhole uh, without the revenue to pay for it. Don't think that's the intention. Oh, no, I'm sure, I'm sure it isn't, but it, it would right, be nice to, you know, do the kind of economic yeah. analysis that you need to in order to satisfy ourselves. I think that's why we've got this bill before <clears throat> it comes to us, so we can mm -hmm. have the time to, as far as seeing as humanly possible, to kind of drill down and figure it out. Okay. So that's I don't know if maybe Anthea to go through a little bit and talk about the taxes and also yeah. Senate Judiciary is, you know, they were taking testimony last week, they're taking testimony again this week, they're still playing around with other ideas, they were considering, you know, maybe looking at what Mass Massachusetts was doing with some, um, with some local fees and, but they, they haven't come up with any additional yes. proposal, but you may hear some, suggest some suggestions or the Senate Judiciary amendment that comes out perhaps next week might contain some new ideas. I know that there's a, the ability of local communities to say no, is it opt in or opt out? It is, uh, it is opt out. Okay. So um, the way that it would work is that if a municipality decides they do not want to have a cannabis establishment in the town or a certain type of cannabis establishment, that was something that we changed this year um, so that Maybe they don't want to have a retailer, but they're okay having a product manufacturer or a or a cultivator uh, in their town. Um, they could put that on the ballot, and and they could do that. And there, the cycle is such that from enactment to the time that you would see the first retail sales, there would be two town meetings where they could put it on the ballot. They could also hold a special election if they wanted to. Michelle, did did Massachusetts do an opt out? They did something uh, with host community host agreements that if you want to do it, and I am not uh, totally up to date about how they did that with the community host agreements, but I um, that is in large part because the sponsors, the primary sponsors of the bill, don't like host agreements and were not interested in pursuing that. So they um, and were pretty felt pretty strongly around. Um, it being a straight um, kind of opt out. Okay, so it's no zoning 
You could do things like that. They would okay. be able to, in, right across the hall, as we speak, they're talking okay. about okay. the municipal Good. authority yeah. and whether or not to kind of refine that and detail that a little more in the bill. Um, they're going to give, uh, Senate GovOps is going to give recommendations to judiciary this week uh, for possible inclusion into the judiciary amendment. Um, but towns could do, use their inherent authority around zoning and things like that. Um, there is a concern uh, on the part of Senator Sears that towns don't go around the opt-out by essentially adopting ordinances and zoning it basically to effectively ban them without actually taking the vote so that's one of the things that they're discussing but I can see I know with liquor establishments mm -hmm. it's 200 feet of a church or a school or it's more than that for a school but there's you can't be near a church or a school or and I, yeah, I would kind of not like a vaping store or a cannabis store across the street from my middle school. Right. And towns would have the ability to, to do that. Okay. There's a thing that the bill includes that, uh, that relates to federal taxation and adjusting Vermont income taxes because certain deductions I gather are, are not possible under federal law. Could you just discuss what that means mm -hmm. in front of the bill? So this is going to be in section uh, 18 of the bill. Um, so it's pulling out from what would be your taxable income deductions that you can't take on a federal level because of the fact that it is still not legal on a federal standpoint. Let, let's, why don't we start with the taxing section at section one and then work our Sounds way good. through. I think it might be better. So. Um, just two things that I want to draw your attention to uh, related to fees is, um, and Michelle did a pretty deep dive into the fees, but um, the board has the authority to collect the fees, and the fees go to the Cannabis Regulation Fund. And I'm just addressing that because all of the other tax revenue either goes to the municipalities or it goes to the general fund. So it's not going into this special fund pot of money. And then within the framework of fee setting, the General Assembly needs to approve fees. And in statute, there are considerations that need to be taken. And some of the ones that are sort of especially applicable here are going to be um, what other jurisdictions are doing, budgetary needs, and then a catch-all of other considerations. So those are things that the General Assembly will be given hopefully information from the executive director on when the executive director makes the fee recommendations. So it's not just out of the blue, it's based on what their needs are gonna be and what other jurisdictions are doing. You're gonna start getting your tax language um, in section 14. And this bill, as it's currently drafted, would create two taxes and both of them are at the retail point. So there are no taxes until you get to retail sales, and then both taxes are applied to the retail price, and there's no stacking of the taxes. So they're calculated on the retail price independent of one another. One is a 10%, what we're calling the cannabis excise tax, and that is going to apply to cannabis, and then in the section summary it's saying cannabis-infused products. That language has since been changed to cannabis products. That is to make it clear, and we draw out food and beverages many times in the bill, that just because something is a food product or a beverage product that has cannabis in it, doesn't mean it's food or beverage that might otherwise be exempt. So it's, if it has cannabis in it, it is treated as the whole thing as cannabis, and the price that is taxed is the price of, I'll use a brownie for example. And this the bill does allow edibles. This bill would allow edibles. So $10 brownie. Yep. So that's, that's the excise tax. And then there is also a 1% cannabis local option tax, not to be confused with other local options taxes that already exist that a municipality can adopt through a charter process. Okay, so if I've already got a local option sales tax, would rooms and meals, it would have to be sales. I've got 1%, I can now get 2% of these sales or in the no. law? And the reason you can't no. is okay. because this bill exempts all cannabis from the sales and use tax. 
So that 6% tax that goes to the Ed Fund, that is not applicable here. It's only the 10% excise and the 1% local options tax. That's, that's a finance issue. And that comes up in the context of the local options tax because that would potentially be the trigger for if you were a municipality that had the local options tax for that to then apply. And this local option tax is easier for a municipality to get in that all they need to do is not opt out and then give the tax department 90 days notice before they're going to start collecting it. Okay, so local option sales don't go to the end fund anyway at this point, right? They go to the town. Yeah. With it's state the sales tax cost. revenue. That's, okay. So this would not be any different. Yeah. So it's really um, its own product that's taxed in its own way with no relation to other other taxes. It's probably not good tax policy. Then. It's a sweep. But it's, it's automatic. So if store opens, as long as somebody files a piece of paperwork, it's covered. Mm -hmm. Is there any administrative fee? There is not in this. It differs from the local option tax with that. I want to say it's a 596 return and the 20% cut that goes back to the municipality. So it's not because you said if a store opens, and I didn't hear the rest of the sentence. Well, we were just learning that the <coughs> municipality has to file something with the tax plan. Right. But <coughs> they're, unlike you know, the Montpelier local option tax that voters have to approve, mm -hmm. This one, if a, if a retail establishment opens and somebody in the municipality files a piece of paperwork, their one percent is coming in. It's it's so it's an automatic thing, and it's set up to try to yeah help municipalities handle this in reality. Thanks. Yeah. So this language um, is provided notice of the imposition to the Department of Taxes at least 90 days prior to the first day of the tax quarter when the cannabis local option tax will be collected. And then for purposes of the taxation that's um, documented, you get a receipt that has both the excise tax and the local option tax on it. Things that are exempt from the tax, both of them, both the excise tax and the local option tax, are going to be um, anything that is sold from a medical uh, dispensary, and that's continuing the way the cannabis products are treated now, as Michelle explained, and that comes from, um, in part, what the tax department has currently said, which is that we don't tax things that, that are prescription, and this you can only get through a prescription. It's one of the ways that the medical program would continue to exist, sort of separate and apart from the retail establishments. And then the other um, thing that is exempt from it are um, sales for resale, and that's so that you're not getting taxing on taxing on taxing. So it's only a so self-owned sale. Would not be taxed. Yeah. Um, so those are the two taxes that exist. Some things to just keep in mind with them are they are paid by the purchaser, and then they are held in trust for the state by the retail establishment, and then it's reported monthly back to the tax department. The local option tax, same deal, and then it's quarterly distributed back to the municipalities that are having the local option tax uh, collected. Okay. Same as with the sales tax. Yeah. Very, very similar standard language in there about liability and about you know um, if there's a mistake in the collecting of the taxes and who's responsible. So it, it mirrors sales and use tax very closely except it's sort of a special tax for this different product. Just so I understand, what happens at the, at the wholesale level? Let's say when someone grows marijuana and sells it to a retailer uh, under, under this and whatever bill we have, <coughs> there would be no federal tax deduction, or no federal tax deductions wouldn't apply on their federal income tax return. So you have just the gross sales that would be taxable for federal income tax purposes? Can you say that one more time? Yeah, the, 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 the wholesaler mm -hmm. sells uh, cannabis to a retailer. Yes. Uh, for the wholesaler's tax return, federal tax return, the income is taxable, but they're not able to do many of the deductions that you would normally do for any other agricultural or other similar Correct. operation. 
So they would then have a higher net income, which would pass through to Vermont. Right, except. For, so on their Vermont tax return. And then what you would do is deduct that, those deductions that they would ordinarily have been able to make on the federal tax return in order to get Vermont taxable income. Is that correct? No, it's more it's reducing it for what the deductions are not able to be. Yeah, in other words, reducing it to the level that it would have been yes. had those items been deductible for federal income tax purposes. Yes. Okay, I just I want to understand how this is structured. We just, we just made it simpler, and now we're going to... It's too, too, too simple. <laughs> you know, now we're going to go back. Look at it and sort of complicate it for us. Okay. Um, one of the other things this bill does is it addresses bundled transactions. So much like you're saying your $10 brownie is taxed at its full $10 price if it's a bundled transaction. So if you're getting um, a t-shirt and you're getting an ounce of cannabis, you would be taxed on that full bundled price unless the retail establishment could establish this is the price of one, this is the price of the other, and then whatever the discount that's pulled out needs to not decrease the price of the cannabis. So there's not a, a tax loophole by saying that the cannabis costs a dollar and the t-shirt costs $27 and you're only taxed on the dollar. Separately from my ginger ale and my whiskey, it's two machines that are, you know, at the liquor store. Oh, okay. It's such a pain. Okay. All right. So there's also language in here that's required, which is since you are not taxing everything, you've got these exe exemptions for the non-resale, uh, for the resale purposes, and for the. Um, cannabis registry, there needs to be language in there sort of explaining why you're not taxing it. It's called tax expenditure language. And there's language in there saying that you are not wanting to double tax and that you are not wanting to um, sort of interfere with lower, or you don't want to increase the cost of medical products to support the health and welfare of Vermont residents. When so you, you say there's no tax for resale, what, what does resale mean exactly? So that would be, it's only at the point of retail, but if you've got someone who's selling, um, and Michelle can probably explain the structure of the sales more, but you've got your grower that's okay, but it's selling. not somebody could buy at a store and sell to his friend. And there would be no way, that would, point of sale would be treated as a retail sale, what you do with it afterwards. Like a lemonade stand, stand. Like you can't tax. Like the, no, but would that be illegal? To set, up, to set up a little supply store and start marketing, would that, would that yeah, be the black no, you market? Can't do that. Right. What's yeah. that? You cannot do that under this. You would have to have your own, this, the license. only sales to the public would be, you have to be licensed through the board. Okay. I think what we we're talking about is that, so you have, you know, a, you could have a cultivator who is selling Got to it. a product right. manufacturer right. cannabis, and then that product manufacturer may sell to a retail establishment, or maybe they're going to sell to a medical dispensary. So the theory is, so the tax is collected at the, the ten percent is collected at the retail level, mm -hmm. exclusively. At the and so the theory is that it's just going to get kicked back up in the supply chain in terms of the cost of doing business, right? And that you're only so is there um, in all the other states that have this? They have varying levels of, well, some of them have varying levels of excise taxes, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any studies that have been done to show what the influence on the black market is, depending upon what the size of the tax is? Um, there, have, there is a lot of information out there. I am not your person for that, but I think probably the witnesses, I think probably uh, the commissioner can speak to that. Jake might be able to talk a little bit about that. There's a lot of information about that, and that's been something that states have really been grappling with since they first started doing the, the retail sales is, um, you know, I, trying to figure out where is that sweet spot. So you're trying to bring as many people as possible from the illegal market into the legal market, and um, and you set them too high, and people aren't going to come. You set them too low, you've got issues, and so and then what's going on with the neighboring states? So if your neighboring state has a much so it has a much lower tax rate, and you've got a lot of borders, are people going to be going to the store that's right across the border instead? And there is a lot of information out there that we can we can get the right people here to talk to about that and get the information for you. But I it's not think it might be good to at least know what 
our neighboring states and our neighbor to the north is doing, which is a whole different system, but it's there. Um, and then, oh, the last bill, probably the first bill we did, not the last, we did a consumer protection cradle to grave kind of thing where we had a chain of command for the product. So we knew who, is that still in this Definitely. one? So we yeah. aren't finding fentanyl laced or whatever no, laced. The seed sale tracking that's required and the board will be uh, adopting rules with regard to, regard to the chain of custody. And I heard that when it came to grading, supervising plants, that we were having some trouble getting a state department that wanted to be responsible. Who's responsible for checking the plants, checking the TCB level, checking who's going to do that? So right now, the regulatory authority is, is, is solely with the board. But the board on this proposal is, 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 is just getting kind of started. The, but it's not so the proposal isn't built out for year two, year three, when you're going to need people doing inspections of facilities. Um, maybe the board will come to you and say, well, there's no sense for us to be doing testing. We have an ag lab that can do that. So let's, so, you know, at, you know, we think that we should be partnering with the Agency of Agriculture and they should be doing the batch testing. Maybe they should be doing the plant health, things like that. So, um, so this, and I don't know if you remember, but with 241, it kind of, it was a, a two and a half year kind of scoped out roll out, but you, you didn't put everything in place in that one first bill, knowing that you're going to kind of build it for that first year, then folks are going to come back and say, now that we understand, we have a little more information and we know what our needs are, then we're going to come back and ask for these particular positions for our second year, we're going to need this type of funding for our second year. But we ought to be able to do some rough estimating as to what that built out cost is going to be. I mean, what are the functions the board's going to have to do? Somebody's going to have to test. Somebody's going to have to supervise. Somebody's going to have to collect and process. I'm, the potential for kingdom building is great here. Um, and I'm just, is there anything in here that says using you know available state resources as far as possible uh, um, again the there is a provision in here with regard to rule making that they're to be coordinating and working with other state agencies that have expertise in particular areas but in terms of assignment of particular duties to another state department or agency it does not do that i think it's important to keep in mind that you know, the, the, there's this phase in, right? So, so this gets up and running in the in the proposal here by the fall. They spend three or four months coming up with some of the basic structure. They then come here and say, "Here's what we think the fees should be for anybody that wants to have a dispensary or a retail outlet to be a producer, and so forth." And and then we wrestle with that. It's going to be hard, it's presumably, to your point, relatively straightforward to figure out how many, what kind of lab capacity you need and what kind of inspection people. It is, I would guess, much harder to predict how many people will apply to fill those slots and each one of them is paying a fee even if they're not granted. I think, well, I guess that's a question down the road, but certainly earlier versions of this proposal have had fees when you apply. And so there is just going to have to be some, some give and take as this evolves and best guesstimates become more refined over time. I can understand that. When is the state ag lab opening? Are we building a new yeah. agricultural <laughs> lab are, at VTC? Yes. So when's it open? Supposed to be open this month? 60 this month? Planes? Yeah, and, and I know that Senator Rogers, next door in institutions, has been... I tried to get him, but they started at 1 o'clock. 
they keyed in on, on hemp testing, and so I, you yes. know that discussion is happening. I don't know. And, and I should say, in full disclosure, my daughter is now doing some of the testing. She's the agrochemical. She's been doing hemp testing all summer. But, uh, so, to your point with regard to you know who who's going to be doing all these yeah. different functions is over time. I mean, you know, back with 241 and still currently, and with the commission's report and 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 now. Agency of Agriculture is saying, well, this is what we think you would need to get started. How many positions? They're envisioning it but about it like within their own agency, if you were doing it with them, having the board within the Agency of Agriculture um, or contracting with them. But um, I think there are resources and people who are looking at currently about whether, you know, what are, what are the positions and uh, resources that you would need to be doing the rollout. But again, um, there's still uh, kind of a lack of information really uh, around um, what what's the capacity going to be. Okay, well I think, you know, th there's a few basic things like this shouldn't go in until we've got the state ag lab open and if it's going to take some special testing equipment we should know that now and we should make sure that that testing equipment goes in to the ag lab. I don't think that's the case. I think it's that you just, um, and I think it's there's I have some language that uh, from the Agency of Agriculture around just modifying the existing language that allows them to test hemp and you just add can cannabis in there for, okay. the, for the cannabis establishments and that they would have the ability to do that. Okay. I, I think those are just questions that as is, is we're looking at the finances. Just, I'm having a hard time getting a fence around this at all. And there seems like there's some knowns, or should be knowns, could be knowns if we looked at it, that we could know up front, um, looking at other states perhaps, so we have an estimate as to what possible, what predictable expenses are. And uh, then know because if they get too high and our license fees get too high, then we're into taking tax money to run the system. And I think we want to make sure we don't do that. I mean, there's, there's, there's also going to be license fees out there somewhere that would give us something to look at. Uh, just only because we were talking about this morning in Senate Ag in relation to hemp. There, there is clearly a role for the state lab, but I don't think the vision is that all testing comes through one state lab. It would more likely be state uh, licensed labs that are also helping, you know, because you're gonna, it's not just testing the flower, it's testing the brown in your lab, you know. So, so there's, it, it, you know, it's because not all of it comes here through random. Because there's a testing facility, so the idea, yeah. I think, is contemplated so that, the, so that regulators would look at, well, you would have the ag lab doing certain types of compliance testing mm -hmm. um, to make sure that if, uh, um, so, if the, so if the board recommended that the ag lab be doing the testing um, on behalf of the state for compliance work, so they say this is labeled as having um, five milligrams of THC per serving and they want to test it and make sure that that's accurate um, but that with regard to other types of testing that the, the rules could pr uh, prescribe that um, that a licensee may have their products independently tested by another licensee so that it wouldn't all so be with the agricultural well, lab can't be a uh, home industry where I had friends who made chocolate chip cookies and sold them at the farmer's market. She had to meet some basic health standards in her kitchen, but she didn't have to have her chocolate chip cookies tested. If I'm going to make marijuana brownies, I would have to have... So there's going to be rules around testing, testing and... Yeah. If you want to sell yep. If I want to sell them. If I want to make all the brands you want for yourself. <laughs> How about my kid's birthday party? Hopefully they're of age. <laughs> it's okay, so I cannot serve them brownies if they are not of age. All right. 
Okay. <laughs> you can't sell chocolate chips if you raise rabbits. Can't sell can, chocolate chips. Can I just ask a, a question? Can you remind us what taxes are on booze? But it's, different, it's different beer and I mean there's there's um, two different tax rates. I we can get that for you, okay. but it's I, it's I, all different depending on the I remember it's more complicated. And, yeah. We have someone coming in this week to talk about because we were asked to have them. Um, Damien is gonna come okay. in and right. talk about how we tax alcohol. Well, then, don't worry, I'll get it for you. Thanks. Yeah. I will say that an initial the ten percent here as the, the starting point for the discussion at Senator Sears to kind of base that on, I know that like when you're at a at a bar or something like that, and you're served a drink, that's a 10% tax on your alcohol. So you yeah, but before they buy the alcohol, right. there's already yeah. excise right. tax layers. on it. <coughs> yeah. Okay, we'll probably be digging a little bit into that. So. Okay. Okay. Is that what you? Got for us. Mark, so I'm just, I, was, I thought the, uh, the committee that is being established is kind of limited. Oh. If you don't have any okay. um, yeah, growers on there or black market people or consumers, and they're reluctant to sort of get their side of the story in if they're not on the, on the stakeholders. You're talking about account. on the control board? Who, who, who are we talking about? Yeah. So on page five. That's one of the things Senate Judiciary has talked a little bit about and GovOps is discussing now is whether or not um, some states have an advisory board to the control board or the control commission and uh, folks are, you know, different minds of that. They say, well, the board can talk to whoever they want to talk to and hold public hearings and hear from everybody and then other people think, you know, like in Massachusetts that for their Cannabis Control Commission, they have an advisory board with like 25 people on it that has, that, you know, is specifically represent different types of constituencies. So there's a lot of models out there. And I think you might want to look at the just thinking of the Liquor Control Board, which I see is somewhat of a compact organization. And then I think of Green Mountain Care, which just seems to be less, maybe they're just more obvious, but they seem to have a lot of employees. Well, they do regulate $6 yeah. trillion. Dollars, six so trillion I, dollars. But I, 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 just, I just want to make sure that we have some handle on what we're creating. I, and that it's, the example that gets me is the example that was to advise on automobile inspections. And the, the new car dealers were the ones who dominated the committee to come up with the recommendations. And we're in our second year of cleaning up after them because they didn't have the, uh, the local shops and, mm, and, and saying, the yeah. people who maintain second you know, used cars who were not represented. So. Okay, well, we'll. We'll be looking at the whole thing. Okay. Actually, Michael, yeah. Uh, not a finance question, but so right now, are the retail stores in Massachusetts open? Yes. Yes. Okay. And can you buy in Massachusetts? There you go. <laughs> you can, can you buy in Massachusetts and safely drive into Vermont with the product? Yes, I mean it's against federal law, but it's not against it's not against Vermont law as long as you're under as long as you possess an ounce or less, um, either in cannabis or cannabis products in the aggregate, you can go to Mass and bring it back. Mm -hmm. Is it per person? Yes. Take the family. But in Canada, because of border issues, you can't do that, right? Right, there's, uh, you know, there are, if anybody's been to Montreal lately, there's, yeah, there's signs. It's interesting, when you're going hmm. north, there's a sign before you go through that says that you have to declare oh, your okay. cannabis at the, at the, with the Canadians. So you mm -hmm. have to let them know, just like if they, when they ask you if you have any tobacco um, or firearms, things like that, they want you to declare you're going from a legal state into another legal jurisdiction. And uh, I don't understand why people are so confused by this, but I guess people just think if it's legal, it's legal and they can go anywhere they want, it's legal. So, but, um, so you're supposed to declare your cannabis and I, I don't know what they do with it. Uh, maybe they take it. Doesn't say don't, but when you're coming back, 
into Vermont, there's a big sign that says you can't bring it back. And that's not because of Vermont, obviously, but because you're crossing the federal border. Yeah, it's a federal law. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Thank you. Sure. Judiciary has been working on this for what? Four years, years six years. At a minimum. Yeah. They like it. So we're just starting. So we'll get we'll get focused in. Okay, next is Craig Bolio. Okay. And you're from the Department of Taxes and okay. And yes. Just bring up a chair if you have someone with right. you. you. Yes, I brought help. All right, good. <laughs> And you know so, the routine, just introduce yourselves yep. for the record. So I'm Craig Bolio, I'm the Deputy Tax Commissioner. And I'm Abby Shepard, I'm a Tax Policy Analyst with the Department of Taxes. Okay. Okay. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Okay, well we had gone through some of the provisions and, and made some notes. Is that, would that be useful to, yes. to go through? Yep. Okay, well, I'll hand it over to, to Abby mostly. Sure, so we um, did, were sort of the primary um, leaders on the tax and regulate subcommittee of the marijuana advisory commission so we've been following this in um, a lot of detail under jake's supervision for the last year and a half um, and we did put out the report and it's available online um, there are some of the questions that you were asking that are in that report that we researched um, and compiled different charts on that might be helpful Good. okay we'll get that here and get it up Online. Sure. So I know just one question just off the top of my head you're asking about liquor taxes. There is um, a wholesale excise tax on the manufacturers who, for liquor at least, this is separate from the alcoholic beverages tax. Um, so there are several other uh, layers to that tax and it is baked into the final tax. So that's a different structure than this. Um, that's in that report as well. So what we had understood from this proposal, which is slightly different from what the commission had proposed, is that there would only be this one 10% um, tax and that sales tax would not apply. So just from a more technical standpoint, the way that we are interpreting this language without um, an explicit exemption, the meals and rooms tax, well really the meals tax may still apply to edibles for very specific circumstances. In particular, because there is an exemption for baked goods that are sold um, in quantities of three or more, um, that would be exempt from the meals tax. But if they're sold just one or two cookies or one or two brownies, um, meals tax would still apply. So there would need to be some exemption um, put in there as well. So it's uh, very it's a specific. Whole section of the law, just knowing some of the confusions that have gone on, that if we ever get a few minutes, I'd like to walk through because. If the law is written in a way that is not clear, then we are to blame. If we don't like how you enforce it, you're to blame. But <laughs> we need to be very clear about what we intend. So this may be a chance to take three or more, but you've got to have it tested by an, by an outside testing facility, which I think will probably do away, unless they're very expensive brownies, with um, sales of less than th or three or more and they don't have s well if not each brownie probably doesn't need to be tested right well you gotta how do i know you're right. not just putting a little bit of well, marijuana in the brownie in the next batch i just it's like the quality it's test for it's a surprise yeah. yeah yeah i mean but you would have to have well, some dual's brownie. outside okay so, That'll be a real crowd. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, okay. We have some <laughs> suggestions. We did propose um, some language in that report, um, and just because of the differences, the way this is drafted, and, and the fact that you're not intending to have sales tax apply, that there might be some ways to bring over some of the sales tax definitions, for example, that would be useful to have in this new tax. Um, that's the main, but that's so fairly just have an it would just be sales tax, but no sales tax. Except for the local options tax. So that's where we also had a few comments and potential suggestions just from an administrative perspective. Because there is the existing local option tax and that has its own administrative provisions, it's yeah. not entirely clear for this new local option, totally separate tax, what provisions would apply, whether it would be the sales and use tax administrative provisions or the local option tax or both, and what would happen in case of a conflict. But notably, we were concerned about the administrative costs because there are no fees 
we're general fund reliant. We do have the local option tax per re return fee that is paid for mostly by municipalities, partly from some of the revenue generated by the local option tax. Right. In this proposal, there is no administrative fee for us to pay for that cost. Um, and this was something that was discussed at length in the uh, Marijuana Advisory Commission, how to um, allocate revenues if it were a, once the revenues have been collected, giving a portion to towns or creating a separate new authority for the local option tax to be levied. So Can you it's just different options. Can you see bullet points about what you would like or issues we need to deal with? Absolutely. And if you just email that to Faith, she'll get it to all of us. Yeah, and I think the I think the concern about the administrative fee is really just that you know there there are many costs that we bear, and it's also a compliance issue at that point, right? Because our staff is able to do auditing at local option tax when when uh, it applies in an audit, and then those fees are passed on to the municipality as well. So there's benefits to the municipality if we have um, resources to be able to do audits on those fronts as well. Okay. Yeah, happy to That's provide a breakdown of. Yeah, I think that provided. would be because this is a whole new, and I'd like to avoid any issues with somebody thinking they didn't because it's a bakery product and they didn't owe sales tax, but they did because they sold X number and. But nothing else goes to sales tax or rooms and meals. And yeah, uh, gummy bears, candy? Candy has its own exemption. So generally, candy would not be subject. But it depends on how it's sold, how it's packaged. Marijuana. But we said that marijuana right. product is going to be taxed no, no matter what, correct? If that's the intent, it would be much easier to administer and to for yeah, the retailers to say, would period. They would always be the cannabis yeah. tax. It would never be. Yeah, that's okay. I believe what the intent is. That's what I heard. And the question. Uh, no. no. Okay. Usually, when it's um, I can read you the link. No, that's okay. That's so okay. anything in cannabis, <laughs> yeah. but it's like a candy <laughs> store. Yeah. Yeah. Is tax. Yes. yes. We you. aren't going to be allowed to put those on the impulse buying on the way out of the grocery store, right? From a tax administration standpoint, and also from the cost that you would incur for building and administering the program. Would it be possible, although I know this doesn't do it, to treat marijuana exactly the way we treat alcohol and thereby use the same kinds of systems, programs, and methodology that you use in dealing and dispensing alcohol? Boy, I hadn't, I hadn't put a lot of thought into that. Um, I, I wonder what it might do to compliance efforts, but it certainly could have some efficiencies to bear if we're able to you utilize have existing to systems. An entirely new system. Yeah, I think that I think the cost challenge that you're going to hit, regardless, is our biggest concern at the tax department is that the federal prohibition mm -hmm. we believe will lead to a lot of cash transactions for us, mm -hmm. which our building is simply not equipped to handle right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we have, we have two major costs as a tax department going into this uh, if it would legalize. One is is standing up new software, so some efficiencies may be able to be gained there. And the other is, is upgrading the security in our buildings substantially. And we've, mm -hmm. we've used other states to, to scale down to Vermont to try to estimate those costs. And it's between 700000 and a million just to get security for the building. And then there are ongoing costs as well, cash managers, armored car services, things like that. So uh, even if we were able to stand up existing systems, that would still be a significant cost that we would have to, well, to figure out. Mm -hmm. I think so obviously the problem about uh, forcing cash transactions is the inability of the marijuana industry to use the banking industry. Uh, what about credit unions? So I, I think it's up to them individually, right? And, and I, I certainly want, don't want to speak for them. There's a credit union that is engaging with the medical marijuana industry now. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's really a decision for each bank and credit union in their own risk profiles to determine whether or not they want to enter into that industry. Any experience with credit card companies as to whether they uh, have their own prohibitions as opposed to the way federal law is true. So I, I may be mistaken on this, but my understanding is that uh, the credit union that operates now doesn't do payment processing, they only do depository accounts, but I may be incorrect on that. Okay. So I think that there's one major issue of depository accounts and then payment processing can be potentially an even bigger challenge, but I'm certainly not an expert in that area. 
Would it be okay for somebody to take their credit card and take $25,000 off of it to build, you know, a company in some way or contribute to their, you, any regulations there? That would be the Department of Financial Regulation. They were part of our um, subcommittee and they would be able to give you a more detailed breakdown because they went into detail about the, um, the banking, federal banking law and how um, oh. banks have to provide different types of suspicious activity reports and same where any financial transactions mm -hmm. are regulated by different payment nope. networks. It's yeah, and any big yeah. transactions. Thank you. Any big deposit of money, the FBI comes to visit you the next day. I know that from housing. Um, I also and just they do a major <coughs> deposit or the, the FBI will follow up because of federal law. So assuming some of these will be good size deposits. In, okay. in terms of tagging on to an alcohol tax, were you, if we were to do that alcoholic beverages tax, I think it wouldn't fit into this structure of not allowing public consumption, because that's um, sitting down and having a drink, whereas you wouldn't be able to consume in public. Otherwise, it would be potentially a wholesale excise tax, like on the liquor side, that but I'm not sure that that would get you the same amount of revenue or capture the types of sales that you want well, certain, that are higher. Well, liquor, though, that you, you certainly sell, and you sell as a you know, package mm -hmm. or for that matter, a convenience mm -hmm. store. So, I think it would have to be that yeah. excise yeah. Um, yeah. wholesale the state, level. The, the state run liquor stores, but mm -hmm. I don't think we and want to And then a sales tax on top of it. Yeah. And then, well, But right again, I guess that is, that's again another question in terms right. of, of, of a mode of distribution mm -hmm. that already exists mm -hmm. uh, that's not beyond the realm of at least considering. Mm -hmm. You may put it in the state liquor stores or just set up a... Why create a whole new regimen if you don't have to? First thing they'll say is Mazda's store doesn't have enough room. But um, it's it's interesting. I, I I would think the closer we could parallel the sin taxes. Yeah. The sin store. The sin you store. Sell lottery ticket. You sell liquor. You sell marijuana. All <laughs> in one place. One stop shopping. Um, then we could put the party store next door. Um, but. There's an excise tax, and that's what this proposes. We can say yes, no, and how much. This one does not propose an additional sales tax. We can say yes, no, or how much. And we can talk about how that would get costed. And again, the rooms, the meals tax, and when that applies, and that's when things get sticky. If I eat my, if, I, if they also serve tea and I eat my marijuana brownie on site, or if I buy my marijuana brownie to take home, are we in two different tax realms? Is it hot or cold? And if you get a bag of chips with it. That's right. <laughs> a big bag. You mean a, a scone versus a brownie? I mean, I, I want to make sure as far as possible, we don't set some retailers up to get in to trouble because we were not clear. I'm going to be watching the drafting on this very closely because I think we need to be clear about what we intend and how it gets written. I don't know if you've looked into it, but I thought I remember reading that Oregon allowed customers to pay at least on debit cards and somehow maybe there's a distinction between credit cards and debit cards. But <clears throat> I think there sometimes is, but again, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in that area. But I think DFR is fairly, fairly well versed in this area. And, and okay, um, and you said about accepting cash payment. Why wouldn't we just insist that payments to state government are not cash? I'm fine with that. Uh, it may be challenging uh, for people who are operating in that industry to be able to comply with that. Um, so I, you know, I'm, certainly that is easier for the tax department if there's a requirement to have a depository account, uh, to have a license. Um, the discussions in the subcommittee, uh, we were really hoping to be able to make that recommendation, but with input from. So far, we didn't feel 
uh, that it would be able to be uh, fully realized that way with the federal prohibition. So maybe what we'll do is, I know this was a lot of concern and it's gotten a lot of bluster from Washington, but I don't know of any action. Um, but maybe what we'll do is have someone who is producing medical marijuana and somebody, if we can, from the dispensaries to tell us how, how it's going and what's worked out. Um, well, and I think if you could get the, the credit unions and banks to say that they would be willing to operate in this market uh, once it's legalized, then that may be a very viable strategy, which, which we would certainly uh, appreciate. We may be able to do that with state, there's state and there's federally licensed banks. Right. And the, I think the same system goes for credit unions, but I'm not sure. So state banks, we might be able to, to work with. We may, or we can set up a state bank. And just, if, just to finish up there, which is a great idea. Um, the, the parallel to liquor, I think, is helpful, but we also have to remember we wholesale. Like, we have a warehouse, right, where every bottle of liquor that goes out off a shelf goes through. That's a pretty big undertaking. In Quebec, I think they have paralleled it to the SAQ, the liquor outlets, but that would be tricky for us also because of the federal prohibition. Mm -hmm. that, that there must be, I mean, we, knew, we do need some expertise on the whole federal navigator. Navigator. Okay. <coughs> I don't know when. We'll start with DFR yeah. and see what they can tell us. Um, we'll have so, banking back. So, if we get a chart that shows what the tax rates are in all the states that have this, and also um, maybe a comparable, at least in Vermont, what the comparable sin taxes are. Try for tobacco and liquor. Is that yeah, in your report? In report. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Is that yes. Okay. Can you find that report, or if they can, if you can send that to Faith, then she can send it to us. That's the state by state comparison also. Yes. Great. That's right at the very beginning. <coughs> I think the, the liquor taxes and tobacco taxes are in the appendix. What is liquor now in Vermont? Between all the taxes. It's the wholesale. I think it's twenty-five percent on. Um, gross receipts of wholesalers above 750000 which I believe is oh, right. the wholesale yes. or most, but I know. Right, except for the little guys. Right. And then, then there's a sales tax also. Yes, that's correct, the 6%, and then if there's any local option tax. But yeah. that's it, and, okay. and any local option tax. That's okay. And a deposit. Except on wine bottles. All right. Senator McDonald. I had two. One, um, one was just technical about the difference between the sales tax and the, and um, an excise tax. And an excise tax is, is when you purchase is for the purchase of the product. And is the sales tax not a consumer tax, which is a tax on mm -hmm. consumption, rather than the nature of the thing being purchased? That's, yeah. So that's getting into more of the conceptual tax definitions. So an excise tax typically is at the manufacturer wholesale level, mm -hmm. um, and it's often on um, the weight as opposed to the price, whereas sales tax are typically at a lorem, which is what is proposed here, but or excise the, taxes may be at a lorem as well. Concentration. Correct. That's on the product. That's whereas at, sales tax is a tax on consumption, the consumer, regardless right. of what, right. what is you choose to be consuming. The so other do the federal meaning. laws recognize those two separations? No, there's no. So when you remit sales tax money, it, the federal government attaches what it happens to. Is concerned yes. about what you're consuming, or when you have an excise tax and it taxes marijuana, they go, now it's a marijuana tax. What's the there's no distinction. It's the product itself. It's the marijuana itself. Um, the Schedule One classification of marijuana is for the cannabis plant. So, so, so they don't recognize that sales tax is based on sales tax consumption. Is, doesn't. But sales tax is all local, so it never goes to the feds. True. 
Neither do, would a wholesale. Yeah. These are all state local taxes. The, the, all those are local taxes, so the feds never touch them. The yeah. Yeah. So there's no argument that this is not a tax on no. marijuana. It's a sale of marijuana. It's a, it's a sale. No. So the, other, the other question was, uh, you seem to be recommending uh, um, that this not be a sales tax. Um, Am I, am I mischaracterizing oh. your as, as testimony as a recommendation? <laughs> just in terms of our administration of it, um, the policy side would leave up to you, obviously. Um, I'm just reading what I'm seeing in the bill and what it seems like the legislative intent is. Um, from our perspective, and I think it's been consistent over the years, is that we would it's easier for us to administer a retail, so retail level tax. Um, uh, we took, um, I think, three or four years ago, uh, we did speak to Washington, and they had originally had a multi-tier. Um, they had an excise tax that they moved to a purely retail sales tax, and they actually kept the name excise tax, and certainly they still call it an excise tax because it's a sin. They consider it a sin tax. Um, but it's they had found it was too hard to administer. It was too costly. Price on the shelf for excise exactly. tax. Exactly. It's just the final tax on the consumer in Washington now. And theirs is 37%, which is one of the highest. Although other states have sales tax as well. So they're, the effective rate tends to be in the so 20s. When we make the choices, this committee, it, 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 it affects um, whether the tax, the percentage of the tax goes to reduce property taxes or is skimmed off to before it gets into the debt fund and used for something else. This one is all dedicated because there is no sales tax well, I, except local option. I'm not sure what we're calling we're it. Just, seems to be the witnesses and just said that they intent. were recommending some right. choices, and one of them was yeah, sales, and the other is local. in the product. Yes, so, yeah. the local tax. But your one concern you'll administer whatever we tell you to administer. But with the present local option tax, you get and a fee to administer that. That's correct. And I percentage. So it's a per return fee of five dollars and ninety six cents, which is paid. Seventy percent of that fee is paid by the. Or sorry, seventy percent is paid by the municipality, and thirty percent is paid out of the pilot fund. And after that fee That's is right, taken it, out, everything. then it gets split seventy percent to the towns, thirty percent to back to the pilot fund. So it's sort of self funding and stuff. But not all towns get um, a piece of the pilot funding. It goes to payments in lieu of taxes where the state has property. Or, right. So not every town, even the towns that have the local option tax, they don't necessarily get pilot funds. So I think that was a concern that towns had about um, dropping cannabis local option tax into the existing structure. Was there any uh, reporting done in uh, the study that compared the cost to the tax department of creating a system using the excise tax in this way versus a simple retail sales tax. So I, I think it's, well, are you saying actually administering an excise tax like by weight? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in other words, doing, doing the excise tax the way is envisioned here compared to the cost of the tax department, both administratively, software-wise, and, and otherwise, of creating a new system. Um, I think I may be confused by your question because the way we see this tax is it's really just a semantic difference between the. I mean, it really is going would be administered very similarly to a retail sales tax, right? Um, which is the easiest version of a tax for us to administer, be able to take gross sales and calculate a percentage from that. Um, it would be more challenging for us to administer an actual weight-based excise tax. It's, it creates uh, that, that more difficulty with compliance okay. for sure. Uh, yeah, you're not going to have to go out and weigh a truckload of marijuana. We appreciate that. That's good. <laughs> so, no, this is getting clearer for me. So this is, we're calling it an excise tax, but it's not paid until the product is sold. Right. Therefore, it really is a 10% sales tax, in correct? Mm -hmm. it's, an excise tax. it's an enhanced. It behaves as similar, that's but right. it's an excise tax. Yeah, so yeah. I, I can certainly see where that leads to some confusion. Right. I think naming it differently is trying to avoid another set of confusion, which would be calling them both sales tax, then people, yeah. So anyway, I'm not sure which is the right way there, but. Well, there's a, you got there's a stamp when you get the yes. cigarettes in the warehouse and you pay the tax. Yes, so, right. there's a floor tax. So, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank us. You.
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, members of the committee, thanks for having me here today. My name is Jake Perkinson. I am the co-chair along with Tom Little of the Governor's Advisory Commission on Marijuana. Uh, that commission and its various subcommittees have worked on a report since August of 2017 and issued a final report in December of 2018. Um, I, really, I just want to check with the chairwoman on how much time we have, I think 15 minutes or so? Uh, 10 minutes? Okay. Um, the break is just if if they're good and don't ask too many questions, then they get a break. Right. Um, you get as much time as you need. Thank you. Um, I, I did have ex more extended comments, but given the time, I, I think I can truncate them and, and kind of key off of the questions that have been raised here. And I think uh, first and foremost, uh, the difference between the uh, bill uh, under consideration today and the recommendations of the commission go in large part to questions about what are the costs. And I think Senator Brock and the chairwoman both raised that, uh, that question of um, how are we gonna pay for the cost? And in the analysis of the commission, those costs were very broad. They included what is the impact on the tax department? What is the impact on the agricultural department? What is the impact on schools? And what can we do? What do we think are necessary in order to address uh, the existence of a commercial public cannabis market um, with respect to youth attitudes and use. Um, and so if you look at the report, which I know will be sent to you, um, they do uh, set forth many of the expected costs um, that uh, we believe would be associated with a regulated market. None of this is to say that we recommend against the regulated market. That was not the purview of the commission. It was only to assume that if a regulated market was in existence, what would be the best way to uh, approach that? And so the 20%, uh, it was an excise tax, 20% uh, excise tax recommended by the commission was in some ways reverse engineered, but also with a keen eye towards uh, the policy of not incentivizing activity towards the illicit market. And so what we did was we, the tax department took a lot of time to look at what was the uh, situation in other, in other states and looked at what the expected sales curve would be with respect to initial sales and, and year after year sales. Apply that to the demographics and realities in Vermont um, and then match that up against what the expected costs would be with respect to uh, the other reports of, of various members of the commis commission including the health department uh, representatives of education and the Department of Public Safety. And in the end, we came up with a 20% excise tax and uh, recommended the uh, application of the 6% sales tax. We, I believe the uh, recommendations to include the 6% sales tax was that there was no uh, philosophically rational reason to exclude marijuana from that tax just because it's marijuana, um, except for potentially the fact that it also has that 20% tax. But again, this goes back to the philosophy of why that 20% tax was recommended. It was recommended um, to take the opportunity, in this instance, to have a product that can wholly fund what are perceived to be the effects of that product. So that instead of spreading the cost of activity across society as a whole, we saw it as an opportunity to uh, target the users, producers, the people that are profiting and benefiting from the use and production of the product to bear the weight of what the ancillary uh, effects of that would be. Did you have fees in your recommendation? There were fees. There was a recommended that there be a fee structure. Um, however, uh, there was no um, there was no quantification of what those fees okay. would be. I think we took, they were envisioned. Yes, and we think we took the same approach as the uh, the Senate bill. Although I think the consensus among the commission the committee members was that. They weren't able to envision a fee scheme that would adequately fund the programs that were being recommended in connection with a uh, tax and regulated system. And so, uh, for instance, if, if you wanted to have um, an administrat administrative agency that was funded up to $500,000, that's probably doable under a fee structure. 
if you wanted to include the uh, education programs or the prevention programs that were uh, recommended, now you're up to nine, 10, 12 million dollars. And there's no fee structure that would credibly um, be in and use. He, that's, that was what my concern was getting to is this, there's a limit. The guy growing, and, and I understand some of the vision is we take the folks that are blow, growing legally now, but that we have a yeoman system of small producers producing. The last one, I think we had big producers in warehouses. But if you're only growing so much, then the fee has got to fit into your cost benefit structure or you're going to go maybe back to being a little illicit or um, go into growing something else, maybe industrial hemp. Um, so the fee structure has to be in line with the profit structure of the business. and. I think that's the, the base concern I was getting at with, uh, you know, if we have to, uh, you know, add one or two people to the, the Department of Ag to test or um, we have to add, you know, somebody else and then we've got to inspect, you know, farms or we've got to do other things, um, those are costs. And those are costs we need to, to be looking at. I think that's right. And I think with respect to the fees, if you're looking at it as a practical matter, there's a dual um, policy analysis. One is, as you said, uh, uh, it needs to be affordable within the business structure. And, and you also alluded to the fact that uh, it needs to incentivize operators in the illegal market to participate in the legal market. So um, there is, you know, the, the challenge of if somebody is operating in a, an illicit market and um, is invited to, to participate in a legal market, what is the incentive? Um, and while it's not directly emphasized in the report, I think um, as I've watched the debate develop, I am, uh, I believe personally, this is not, as I said, not necessarily the commission's report, but um, although it is uh, assumed in that report is that um, enforcement is an absolutely critical part of any scheme and the funding for that for that enforcement has to uh, be provided for. Uh, I don't think that you can rely on local police departments to do more than they're already doing um, in uh, monitoring the situation and I feel that the opportunity is, is available in a tax scheme to tax the, uh, the operators and participants in this market to fund the necessary efforts uh, to address that. Um, I was just looking into the tax department did do a, uh, a budget, a consolidated budget, and they estimated that in the first year, if the recommendations of the commission were adopted, which may be perceived by some as, as too much, although I think that it's, to me, it's the minimum. Um, I can I understand there's a difference of opinion. Um, Pre-retail um, sales, they're estimating 7.7 uh, .7 million uh, would be necessary to ramp up um, in departments such as health, public safety, municipalities, tax, agriculture, uh, and the regulatory body itself. In the second year, that raises that goes up to 14 million. The second or the first year of retail sales, 14 million. Second year, 15 million, and then 17 million in, in year three. Um, now. One thing that the commission report also points out is that even the 20% excise tax does not fully fund the recommended programs um, to address uh, the existence of a legal market. Um, and so there still may be some requirement that there be funding from other sources. Um, and that's, that really was, and perhaps this informs my position in, in uh, presenting to you today, but the, uh, the uh, text presented to the commission by the governor was to find a way where there would be no net impact uh, financially on the state from a regulated market. That might be an impossible dream, um, but... We were starting out this entire process, we were seeing this as a cash cow that was going to infuse money into the state, and now it's become, we just don't want it to cost us money. 
I think that the experience of the majority of states that have legalized has been that at best it's a wash. It's not a it's not a revenue source that can okay. fill any holes or anything okay. like that. And necessarily, as it expands, there'll be more resources that are necessary uh, to dedicate to it. And I would I would say that it, it's it's somewhat heartening to to see the discussion at least anticipate what are the known risks of entering into this. And that's why it would be uh, you know. The, the cost estimates are so much more expensive than just simply saying, okay, here's here's a regulatory budget and we're done. Um, and so, you know, that I, I acknowledge that's a, a philosophical shift from a lot of legislation, but I think it's one worthwhile um, investigating. Um, I just have to say, I think it's a mistake to assume that all these expenses are at zero today and are going to show up. There's hundreds of thousands of Vermonters using marijuana on the regular. So, you know, we, we, we really have approached this debate far too often pretending we're at zero and we're going to offer it. Yeah, that's just not going to exist. Right. Did the commission have any ability to do an analysis that was outside of the direct revenue? In other words, okay, you hear reports out of Denver that HVAC you know, they can't possibly fill HVAC jobs and electrician jobs and, and you can't rent warehouses anymore. I mean, there's just like the economic activity that is sort of ancillary to, to the industry around cannabis is, is been a major economic driver. I, have, I don't have the foggiest idea how you measure that, but clearly that shows up in the state revenue in Colorado. Did we look at that sort of the stuff outside of just the direct sort of production line to consumers? <laughs> right. That was explicit, explicitly excluded from any revenue estimates uh, either directly to the, uh, the cannabis fund uh, as recommended by the board or anything else. Uh, so that was not, it is, as you say, a very difficult thing. I would like to uh, address a comment of, of it going from zero to something. Um, I don't think that the commission made the assumption that nothing is happening now and that everything will be a disaster if you legalize. I think the assumption, the working assumption was there's a problem now that's not being addressed right. and that the revenue from this is an opportunity to address that. And I would also add that um, the position of the health department is that not only will it help to address the issues with cannabis abuse, access by uh, minors and public safety, but also other uh, illicit substances and drugs. And so I think that there's uh, some benefits uh, that you know, this provides an opportunity to address. So I, I certainly don't want to suggest, and I, I, I don't think that anybody's come up with a credible um, uh, ratio of what is going to be the increase. Um, there's lots of studies that different people can point to that says use has gone up, use has gone down, crime has gone up, crime has gone down. Uh, we're too short, uh, we have too short a time period uh, of legalization at this point in order to make any, for anybody, I think, to make a, a, a absolute claim as to what's going to happen. So the same question I sort of had before, they said there's a lot of studies out on this. What is the elasticity between the price of drugs and marijuana sold on the regulated market as to people making their choice as to whether to get it mm -hmm. on the black market? I would assume that there's a lot of people who, if it was regulated, would pay a premium actually pay a premium price to get it in a place where they know it's seed to sale and, and not have to take the risk of buying something for, with fentanyl laced in it for 10% less or something. Right. I, I think there is um, certainly, at least anecdotally, um, the assumption that, that and, and, you know, uh, uh, certainly reports that people prefer to have a market that has some consumer protections and some testing and some reliability. Um, as far as the price uh, elasticity, you have seen, I think, in every market where it's been legalized that after an initial um, price set that it goes quickly down year over year. What goes? What? The price of, of the legal product goes down, except with respect to edibles. The legal? The le in the legal market, right, in the legal market it goes down. But at the same time, tax revenues go up because as the price goes down, cons consumption or sales. I, I want to make that important part, point. It's not necessarily that consumption overall is going up. 
means that the, the uh, purchases in the legal market have gone up. Um, as, the, uh, as the market matures, while the price goes down. Because I think we have always operated alcohol as a necessary evil, and we did not want to encourage use, at least in theory. I know we have done that with that play responsibly <laughs> rider on the, on the lottery. Um, but in this one, it sounds like we're, we're not regulating the price. It's going to float. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if it's consumption or just more people are going to do it because we keep raising the price of cigarettes. So maybe we'll switch. Um, but again, we don't know. But there's definitely a kind of a different mindset dealing with this. Yes, and our, our recommendation was to, to house the, the uh, Cannabis Control Board within the Department of Liquor and Lottery um, under the uh, rationale that it made sense. Um, I forget which center said the sin, you know, the sin shop or the center sin, yeah. um, But the just because of the philosophical approach to that would be more in line with uh, liquor and lottery. Uh, the challenge in applying a straightforward um, liquor model as it exists in Vermont is the fact that the liquor department, uh, as I understand it, it becomes a bailee of the warehouse materials right. and there was great concern that uh, state employees becoming bailees of a uh, federally prohibited product would be uh, problematic. And so that would be, that's, I think that's where most of the money uh, that the operations generate from liquor uh, come from. Uh, and so that would not be available in, in the uh, cannabis market unless they were willing to take control. Why does the price go down after a couple of years? Just efficiency to market? Or? I think it's supply. I think it's supply and efficiency, yes. Is there any concomitant evidence that there is a similar reduction in the volume in the black market mm -hmm. at the same time? I'm not aware of any of any really reliable studies. Um, again, just in Colorado did so. I, I, I think they I think they have, and, and they, they may be out there. I'm not aware of, of any off the top of my head. But my sense is that um, in the legal markets, the um, consumers in the legal markets tend to buy from the legal purveyors, which leads an excess of illegal product that exists in the state as well as legal product, which goes across state lines. And while people can certainly, as a practical matter, go to Massachusetts and purchase cannabis and bring it to Vermont, as a legal matter, it's, it's just as illegal to do that as it is to bring it into Canada. Um, the only difference is that there's more enforcement along the Canadian border than there is along the Massachusetts border. Okay. I think part of this, because we've been told the reason the taxes are proposed to be lower than alcohol is because we're trying to get away from the um, the black market. I assume, and I know Damien did a whole rewrite of our liquor laws, which hadn't been updated since Prohibition, or the end of Prohibition. I gathered they were interesting. But I would assume at the end of Prohibition, we were trying to do the same thing. Right. And I'm also assuming, unlike cigarettes in a pack where you have a tax stamp, that if I'm buying an ounce in a baggie, is there anything that says that this is regulated or black market? I mean, it, once, like some kind of warning once I've got it in my pocket, oh, yeah. if mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, right now the threat is somebody stops you and you've got, or not, perhaps not now, but two years ago, you get pulled over at a traffic stop, you've got marijuana, the police are gonna to wanna to know where you've got it. So there's a risk to the buyer, or the, the grower, because they're doing something illegal. Right now, if you get, a year from now, if I get stopped and I've got a baggie, I can say, well, I bought it at my local store. There's nothing on, there's no marker on 
that product that says this was purchased legally? I believe the commission uh, recommendations were to have labeling of products, uh, including uh, the harvest date and, um, okay. and the, 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 the amount of content of THC in a particular product, as yeah. well as to provide for childproof uh, packaging mm -hmm. and to have universal symbols that indicate okay. what it was. And I believe, I don't know, maybe somebody else in the room can testify to this, but I believe in, in Colorado you get a specific receipt that. Um, Okay, so that should make it clear. Clear. All right. And I think the point about the prohibition is, is, is directly on point. I think those same conversations we're doing have that we're having today. In fact, I just picked up an autobiography or a biography of Louis Brandeis. He testified before the uh, Massachusetts legislature in 1891 about reforming their liquor laws. And the, the quote that stood out to me in that was. No law can be a good law. Every law must be a bad law that remains unenforced. And that really resonated with me in watching the debate here. I, again, would, uh, I'm no Justice Brandeis, but I think that uh, it would be uh, very important to ensure that any law that is passed has the resources to, to effectuate its enforcement. Enforce it, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. For our first day out, this is a lot to think about. Mm. You know, one of the, I read this great book that, I'll, that Tom Stevens gave me, which was the history of, of ending prohibition. It was written by, I think, the Rockefeller Commission that was sort of like, we're, we're supportive of prohibition, but if you're going to do it, here's how you do it. And it was, it was a lot of interesting lessons, but one of them, to your point, kind of, is that alcohol is a social thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's why there were speakeasies. It's different with cannabis. It's it's you pick it up and you put it in your pocket and go. You know, it's it's there's just an entirely different nature. So it, it's easy to hide in that sense. <laughs> Whereas you know the the speakeasy was an open joke that uh, required corruption up and down the, <laughs> the regulating food chain, um, and ultimately is why we repeal prohibition. Right, and I, I think it makes it all the more challenging to bring the uh, cannabis producers into a legal market because they've had 60 years operating in the illegal market. Uh, they ain't broke, don't don't fix it, and you know, uh, so it, it's a challenge. I don't envy the, the folks uh, charged with drafting the final legislation. So good luck. <laughs>